Hello, thank you for joining us. My name is Carly Moore and I'm Associate Program Officer at the Native American Agriculture Fund. We're excited to be partnering up with USDA NAS today to bring you just a short webinar on Ag Census 101. Uh, this is not intended to cover everything because you could spend a, a full-time job doing that um, and lots of people do. We just want to give you some quick tips, show you what's accessible and how to get there and then hope that you will take some time to go on your own and make this ag data work for you in your area. You can give us questions throughout the uh, presentation. If you look at your GoToWebinar control panel, you should see a gray tab that says questions. Just type them in there. The organizers will see it. We'll ask questions as each presenter wraps up their portion and um, we'll have question time at the end as well. So uh, our CEO, Janie Hip is joining soon uh, and she will greet you when she logs in. But right now I'd like to turn it over to Virginia Harris at USDA NAS and she will give you a greeting from their team and launch into her presentation. So Ginger, welcome. Hi, thanks Carly for inviting us to join you. I'm Ginger Harris with the National Agricultural Statistics Service. I've worked for NAS for over 15 years and primarily work on the census of agriculture with a focus on the demographics, in particular, the demographics of US producers such as race, ethnicity, age, and just the general economics of how our producers are operating their farms. Give me a second, because I'm not very good at multitasking. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen so you can see the start of my presentation. And while I do that, um, I wanted to introduce some of my colleagues who are on the line. Michelle Raddick, who is in our DC headquarters, who has worked on American Indian um, data for the Census of Agriculture for even longer than I have. And Eugene Young, who is the director of our Delta Regional Field Office, which is located in Little Rock, Arkansas. He's happy to assist people with data, and he has counterparts in 11 other field offices across the U.S. who are also great resources if you need help accessing data. And, of course, you're always free to contact me or Michelle or anyone at NAS for help finding our data. I don't know if Michelle and Eugene want to quickly uh, say hi and let you know what they do. And I'm going to give them a moment to do that. They may be on mute, but um, they are on the line, and um, I would be happy if they want to chime in at any time and um, make any comments they want. But with that, I'm going to start my presentation. Um, I'm here to talk today about the some of the a very brief picture of some of the data from the 2017 Census of Agriculture, and particularly the data. On American Indian producers from that census of agriculture. So, um, Carly, can you confirm you can see my PowerPoint presentation? I see it. All right, so we should be good to go and uh, bearing any uh, user errors and technology and internet. Um, let me know if you have any issues as I go along and you stop seeing it or anything like that. So we conduct, I'm trying to advance the slides, let's see. It's a little slow. Um, so NASA has conducted the Census of Agriculture since the 1997 census. However, the, census, the history of the census stretches back much longer than that. In fact, the first census was conducted in 1840 in 26 states in the District of Columbia. Um, as part of the population census. Almost 200 years later, we're still conducting the census. Um, in fact, the 2017 Census of Agriculture, the latest census, is the 29th in the series, and the fifth census conducted by NAS. Um, we took over the authority to conduct the census from the Census Bureau in 1997, and we do a census every five years, which encompasses all 50 states, Puerto Rico, 
and outlying areas. Data is, is available at the national level, the state level, the county level. In addition, we have published data by congressional districts, watersheds, zip codes, and of interest to this group uh, for select American Indian reservations. So one of the most important things to understand when you're looking at the census data is what is a farm? A farm is any place, and this is a definition that's been in existence since 1974, any place from which $1,000 or more of agricultural products were produced and sold or normally would have been sold during the census year. So we recognize things happen in agriculture. Unfortunately, agriculture is subject to many different forces. You know, you could have a drought or a flood and all your crop or your livestock could be lost and you're not able to sell anything in a particular year. So the census operates on this uh, definition of we're gonna count you if you usually produce $1,000, even if you did it in the given census year. But the other thing is that $1,000 is a pretty small amount. So to produce $1,000 in agricultural sales, you may only have a few acres of corn or a couple head of cattle or you know 10 or 20 sheep or goats. So the census counts very small farms and multi-million dollar farms. So that's another important thing to think about when you're looking at census data. This widespread in the types of farms counted in the census of agriculture. So this is just a, a overall view of the United States. And it's a map that shows you by county how many farms are in a particular county. And on this particular map, one dot equals 200 farms. And so you can see large concentrations of farms in the Midwest, in East Texas, in California, you know, and, and you know, this band where I'm located in Kentucky, in Tennessee, we have a large concentration of right here, pretty small farms. But you can see there are farms all over the U.S. Um, you know, sparser numbers of farms in the West, but still, there's lots of farms in all 50 states. Um, the top 10 states probably won't be a surprise to most of you. Texas has by far the most number of farms, almost 250,000, followed in the top five by Missouri, Iowa, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, and Ohio. Um, so that's where all, that's all farms in the US. Now let's talk about where American Indian and Alaska Native operated farms are, and where are the top states for American Indian producers. Well, you can see this map is a little different than the map of all US farms. Um, this is a, also a county level map, but instead of the number of farms, it shows the share of farms operated by American Indian producers. And again, you can see um, some large concentrations of American Indian operated farms in Oklahoma, in the Southwest, and again in the Northern Plains, and then in some locations in the Eastern United States. So, the top five states for American Indian farms look a little different than farms overall. Um, and this is American Indian operated farms. Um, if any of the four producers on the farm said that they were American Indian on the census of agriculture. So the top five states are Oklahoma, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and California. Moving on. Um, what were the top crops produced by American Indian farms? Well, just like farms overall, grains and oil seeds, so your corns, your soybeans, your wheat, rice, barley, etc., was the top commodity grown by American Indian farms. So American Indian farmers produced almost $1.5 billion worth of crops in the 2017 census of agriculture, of that about a third, a little more than a third, were grains and oil seeds. Other important crops were fruits, tree nuts, and berries, and other crops and hay. Um, other crops would be anything that's not listed in one of these uh, 
particular commodities. Um, that would be sugar beets, um, peanuts, a variety of other things. But definitely your forage crops are a large component of those other crops and hay. Um, let's look at the livestock side of production. Uh, American Indian operated farms, uh, a greater share of the value produced on those farms came from livestock, about $2 billion, over $2 billion worth of livestock and livestock products were sold during the last census year. Of that, um, almost more than half were from sales of cattle and calves. And what might surprise you is the next largest commodity produced by those farms, poultry and eggs. And then you have uh, various other categories such as milk, hogs, pigs, sheep, goats, horses, etc. cetera. Um, as we know now in this COVID era, where some of us are relying on working from our homes, having internet access is vitally important to, to people across the United States, and particularly as they're trying to conduct their businesses, their farms, they're trying to um, teach their children remotely. So one of the things that the Census of Agriculture tracks is the number of farms who have access to the internet, and in particular, what kind of access do they have, whether it was through a mobile data plan, through DSL, cable modem, satellite, and on those four unfortunate souls, those who rely on dial-up for their internet access. And we can say, say that overall, 75% of farms in the US had access, but we definitely see some patches where access is much lower, and you see this big um, white spot in the Southwest, which is essentially the counties of the Navajo Reservation where you have much lower rates of internet access than in other places. And we also do have this data available for American Indian producers as well as farms overall. So uh, just a quick bit on the demographics of farm producers, some terms and definitions, and then a uh, more in-depth look at American Indian and Alaska Native producers. So one of the things that's important about the census it's the only source of demographic data we have for producers that's available down to the county level. We have, we collect detailed data on the census for up to four persons per farm. And one of, some of the demographic data that we collect is on the race and ethnicity of farm producers. And we use those categories uh, that are established for federal surveys um, that are promulgated by the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, and we use um, the specific categories they specify. And then we publish the data in two different ways. We publish um, for producers who select American Indian and American Indian, wait, excuse me, who select American Indian and Alaska Native, regardless of whether they reported another race. And then we also publish data using a different method where we report producers by race. It, for example, if they uh, reported American Indian or Alaska Native, regardless of whether they also reported an additional race. Um, and we know, for example, we know from the data that American Indian producers, the counts using these two methods differ um, by quite a bit. More American Indian producers uh, report other races than some of the other ethnic groups or some of the other racial categories. So sometimes you'll see two numbers for the census, and this is um, one of the big reasons why you need to be um, sensitive to which number is being used. So if you see two numbers, this is most likely the reason why they're picking one or the other of the census tabulation. So this is looking at that um, data where people can report more than one race. When we look at that data, you can report being Hispanic separately from race. So there were about 100, over 100,000 Hispanic producers 
And then you can see that the census counted over 80,000 people who reported being American Indian or Alaska Native. And you can compare those numbers um, to the other racial groups, Black, Asian, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. Um, how did the numbers change from 2012 to 2017? Um, just a heads up, from 2012 to 2017, the census um, in response to feedback from data users, uh, we reviewed how we collected the data on producers and changed um, some of the way we're, we report on producers. In the past, we only collected data for three people. Now we're collecting data for four. And in addition, we asked people to report people who were involved in making any decisions for the farmer ranch. Um, and Overall, we saw this tended to increase the number of people for whom we were collecting data, which we feel is more reflective of all the people who are involved in making decisions for U.S. farms and ranches. So we can look at two ways of looking at how data, how the numbers change for American Indians from 2012 to 2017. We can look at the number of farms, and you can see where farms for where people reported being only American Indian. There was a small decrease in the number of those farms. There was a larger, an increase in the people, in the number of farms where any of the producers reported being American Indian, regardless of whether they reported another rate. So that was up about 7%. Overall, across all farms in the US, the number of farms went down to about 3% from 2012 to 2017 to put those numbers in context. And then you can look and see how the number of producers change. As I said earlier, in response to feedback from data users, we refocused and revised the section on which we collected demographic data. And overall, that tended to lead to more people being reported. And you can see that is true for the people reporting being American Indian. The number of producers who reported being American Indian alone was about the same but the number of people reported being American Indian alone or in combination increased by about 10%. So one of the things the census does is it enables us to take an in-depth look at farms operated by people of uh, specified race groups. So the census, because it's the census of all farms in the U.S., you know, we counted 3 million farms, or we mailed out forms to 3 million people. We counted just over a little over 2 million farms. We have a lot of data, so we can slice and dice that data in various ways. One of the ways we, we like to tabulate and uh, categorize farms is by their quantity specialization. Um, that's often in our tables called the North American Industrial Classification System, and it identifies the primary commodity produced by a farm. What was the commodity that accounts for 50% or more of agricultural sales from a farm? And then this is just a little chart showing you how all farms compare with farms with American Indian producers. You can see fewer American Indian producers produce oil seeds and grains but more produce beef cattle. And in particular, you see a big difference in that there's a much higher share of American Indian producers who are sheep and goat, special, who specialize in sheep and goat production. So one of the things that we're able to do on the census is we have a section on the census form that says, did you grow crops or or produce livestock within the boundaries of an American Indian reservation. And then we take the data from the census form, tabulate it with, against all the other data in the census form, and produce a report about agriculture on American Indian reservations. Um, we have a detailed report. I'm just going to highlight a few numbers. Um, we published data for 73 reservations, and we found that there were 25,000 farms that operated at least in part on the American Indian Reservation. Of those, about 19,400 of those 
farms that operated on, on an American Indian reservation were actually operated by American Indian or Alaska Native producers. And so we can break that down further by the count of farms by reservation. And you can see by far the largest number of farms were on the Navajo reservation with all the most six, over 16,000 farms, um, followed by the Flathead, the Blackfeet, the Nez Pierce, and the Fort Peck reservation. And you can again break that down by um, whether those farms were operated by any producer or whether they were operated by Indian, American Indian or Alaska Native producers. And uh, in addition, you can look at the number of acres in land and farms on those various different reservations. Again, the Navajo Reservation has the most acreage in agricultural production, but some of these numbers are very different than just looking at the number of farms on the reservation. So I know Carly has planned a very um, dataful afternoon for us looking at data from the Ag Census. So this is just a really brief highlight of some of the data you can get when you look at the census publication. We're happy to share this data with you in ways to make it more accessible. Just let us know what you need. I've included my contact information in this presentation. And feel free to email, to call, and let, and if you have any questions at all about using the data from NAS, I'm happy to answer questions, happy to help you access it, give you tips and tricks. I'm definitely available. Just give me a phone, phone call or email me. And um, if, if we're not sharing the presentations, I'm sure Carly will provide you my uh, phone and email address. Thanks again, Carly, for inviting us to share some of the data from the Census of Agriculture. We're very grateful um, for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ginger. Um, we will make available your presentation with your permission. Uh, we'll bundle it with all of the slides from today and have that on our website, along with the recording of this webinar. Uh, we had a few questions that came in during the presentation, Ginger, so I just wanna uh, take these now. First question is, how do you define an American Indian operated farm? Do you ask if the actual farmer is enrolled in a tribe or is it just if the farm is located on the reservation? So we don't actually ask about enrollment. Um, we ask um, standard race and ethnicity questions. So um, we do ask um, the producers to report and we collect, so basically on, for demographics on the census, we ask people to report anyone who's involved in making decisions for the farm and ranch. And then we ask them to report if they are of five race categories, American Indian, Black, um, Asian, Native Hawaiian, or White. So this, the data that you saw today is if any of the four people for whom we collect detailed demographic data reported that they were an American Indian, their data would have been tabulated in the census of agriculture as an American Indian operated farm. Thank you. So uh, hope that answers the question. And the second question was about the granularity of the information available on the reservations uh, data. Uh, the person asked if it can be broken down by chapter house or by zip code. So zip code data is available all across the U.S. We haven't, um, and I can definitely give you a link to that. Um, I don't think there's any race or ethnicity data available that we publish at the zip code level. However, I believe today um, we did release data um, for chapter houses on the Navajo reservation. Um, that was a special tabulation request. And we were able to do that because, um, as you saw in some of the numbers, um, the Navajo Reservation has many more farms compared to many of the other reservations. So there will be data available for Navajo chapter houses. And I believe that was supposed to go out today, and I can verify that um, after during the other presentation. 
Thank you. That's exactly uh, where the person who was asking the question was from. So hopefully we'll be able to share that with them. I just want to take a moment now. Uh, thank you, Ginger, uh, Michelle, and Eugene for joining us. And I hope you'll stick around and jump in as you wish throughout the rest of the presentation. Now we're going to transition to uh, some NAF folks to show you what is possible, uh, what we've done as um, an organization interested in native agriculture. Before I go there, I see that my CEO, Janie Hip has joined the call, and I'd like to give her an opportunity to address you all. So Carly, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Well, thanks everybody for joining today. And um, I think this is a great gathering of uh, data nerds. And I say that in a loving way. <laughs> so uh, all of the folks um, inside our organization that work with you all on the phone and Ginger and Michelle and Eugene, I think we all fall into that category. But I'll tell you, it's so important for us to know our numbers. And the Ag Census uh, data is extremely important to all of us. And uh, we've been working, I've been working, and many of us on our team have been working alongside our, our friends at NAS for many years uh, to try to get better and better data um, on, on what it, exactly it is we're doing. And the reason why is really important because it helps us um, it helps us know more about each other and ourselves, but it also helps us tell our story better. And so that was part of the reason why we wanted to do uh, the webinar today and just give you a taste of how this data looks, right? And also how you can think about using it in your grant applications uh, as they come in for NAF funding, but also as they come in to USDA and all of its various funding authorities too or anyone else for that matter. And so uh, we just are happy, very happy to be on the call with everybody today and, and really kind of dig into the numbers because it really is super important for us to plan for our future and figure out exactly how we can build for success today. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Carly. Thanks for, thanks uh, Michelle and Ginger and Eugene, y'all are great friends and we're happy to have you on the phone with us today walking through some of this information and answering questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janie. And so now we will transition to Keely Dovish, a data analyst intern uh, with NAF. She will present slides from her computer and tell you about herself um, before she starts. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Keely Dovish. I've been with the NAF for the past couple of months as a data analyst intern. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with the Ag Census data, so today I'm going to be sharing some of my findings to show how that can be used. Okay, so this here is the states of interest, and this is important to note because I'm going to be talking a lot about these states through the presentation. And the, those states of interest are states with American Indian and Alaska Native populations, over 1% of the overall American Indian and Alaska Native population. And you can see those states are highlighted in green on the map and also listed. This map is looking at the number of American Indian Alaska Native producers by state, which you saw earlier from Ginger's presentation. And we can see that there's a high concentration in four states, which are New Mexico, Arizona, Oklahoma, and Texas. And for some reason, the percentages are not showing up, but um, they will on the website when the presentation is posted. This map is looking at the percent of American Indian Alaska Native producers by state relative to the overall population of American Indian Alaska Native producers. 
and we can see that the top three states are Arizona, Oklahoma, and New Mexico, which are all states of interest. And then we, the bottom three states are New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and the bottom state of interest is Tennessee. Moving on to farms with internet access among American Indian and Alaska Native producers by state. And like I said, there were supposed to be percentages, but those will be able for you to access later. And this is important because of the growing importance of precision farming and big data, which requires internet access. And on average, 66% of American of farms with American Indian Alaska Native producers have internet access. And we can also see that the bottom three states are New Mexico, Utah, and Arizona, which are states of interest. And the top three states are Connecticut, Vermont, Wyoming, and Alaska. And the top state of interest is Oregon. So this is just zooming in to the previous map, looking into the Southwest region, which we can see that those farms have very low internet access. And it's important for these farms to have internet access for gathering information, looking for jobs or employees and to participate in the world's changing economy. And like I said before, there's a lot of emerging technology and technology that already exists that requires internet access. This map is looking at the average market value of products sold per farm with American Indian Alaska Native producers by state. And the star on California is indicating that it has the highest average market value. And it's also noted that states of interest with high numbers of American Indian Alaska Native producers have the lowest average market values, which is not good. Um, the top three states are California, Kansas, and Alabama, which are all states of interest. And the bottom three states are Connecticut and West Virginia with Arizona, and then Arizona with Arizona being a state of interest. Moving on to average net cash farm income per farm with American Indian and Alaska Native producers by state. And just to define the average net cash farm income, it's defined as cash receipts from farming and farm related income plus government payments minus cash expenses. So you can see the star on South Dakota indicating that that state has the top net cash income. And we can also see that there's a lot of states of interest that have really low net cash farm incomes. And Arizona and New Mexico actually have negative net cash farm incomes, despite having some of the highest numbers of American Indian Alaska Native farmers. So the bottom three states are Hawaii, Maine, and Massachusetts. And then the bottom state of interest is Arizona which is negative 3,551. And the top three states are Georgia and Arkansas. Okay, so this is looking into the American Indian Alaska Native odds ratio by state. And the odds ratio basically tells you the likelihood of being an American Indian or Alaska Native person if you're a farmer in each state. And this was equated by getting the percentage of American Indian Alaska Native producer population by state and then dividing that by percent of overall American Indian Alaska Native population by the state. Um, the U.S. has an overall odds ratio of 1.12, meaning that overall you are more likely to be American Indian or Alaska Native if you are a producer. And there are 38 states that rank above the 
Texas, odds ratio over the world. So the top three states are Arizona, Hawaii, and New Hampshire. And the bottom three states are South Dakota and Wisconsin. So this is looking at the odds ratios that are above or below one in each state. So there's 39 states that have an odds ratio above one, meaning that those states are more, you're more likely to be an American Indian, Alaska Native person if you are a producer in those states. And for all the states below one, which are orange, it means that you are less likely to be an American Indian, Alaska Native person if you are a producer. So this is looking into female American Indian Alaska Native producers. And we can see that Arizona has the largest number of female American Indian Alaska Native producers. And the lowest concentration of female producers is in Nebraska, Illinois, North Carolina, Massachusetts, South Dakota, and Alabama. Looking further into female producers, we can see that the highest concentrations of female American Indian, Amer Alaska Native producers among states of interest are found in Arizona and Utah. And we can also see by looking at the map that female American Indian, Alaska Native producers are underrepresented in Illinois and in the Plains region. And the top three states are New Hampshire, Arizona, and Utah. And the bottom three states are Nebraska and Illinois, and then North Carolina, and finally, Massachusetts. This is showing the percent of all US female producers by state, and it's just to compare it to the map that we saw before with the American Indian Alaska Native producers. And looking at this map from the previous map, we can see that there is higher representation of American Indian Alaska Native female producers in farming than all U.S. female producers overall. This is looking into the number of American Indian Alaska Native producers under 35 years of age by state. And we can see that young farmers are scattered through the country, other than those states that are concentrated down below. And we can also see that the highest number is found in Oklahoma. Moving on to the percent of American Indian Alaska Native producers under the age of 35 by state. We can see that the top three states are Connecticut, New Hampshire, Alaska, and then North Dakota with the states of interest top state being Oklahoma and Alabama tied at 13%. And then the bottom three states are Mississippi, Nevada, and New Jersey. To compare to the previous graph, this is looking at the percent of all U.S. producers under 35 years old by state. And comparing this graph to the previous graph, we can see that young American Indian Alaska Native producers represent a high portion of young farmers and represent a more equitable spread across the nation. So this slide is looking at the percent of American Indian Alaska Native producers that work no days off the farm. So it's common for these percentages to be pretty low because it's very common for farmers to have to work additional jobs besides farming. So those top three states are Arizona, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. And the bottom three states are New Hampshire, then New Jersey and Connecticut, and then Alaska, with the bottom state of interest being Tennessee. Now, 
Now we're going to be looking into land and farms with American Indian Alaska Native producers by acres, also by state. And we can see by looking at the map that the farmland is pretty specific to seven states. Well, not specific, but it's concentrated in seven states. And those seven states are Arizona, New Mexico, Montana, Utah, South Dakota, Oklahoma, and Washington. This is comparing the previous graph to the land in all U.S. farms. So there appears to be an even distribution of land across the U.S., with the exception of Texas, of course. However, farmland specific to American Indian and Alaska Native producers is concentrated in seven states, as we saw in the previous map. Now looking further into land and farms, this is looking at the average size of farms with American Indian Alaska Native producers and acres by state. And we find that the largest farms with American Indian Alaska Native producers are in the Western US region and Alaska. Um, the top three states with the biggest farms are Nevada, Utah, and Alaska. And the states with the smallest farm sizes are Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland, and then the bottom state of interest is Tennessee, the smallest farms. And finally, this is looking into the percent of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander producers by state. And just by looking here, we can see that Hawaii would obviously have the highest amount in concentration, and Illinois actually has the lowest amount. But overall, it's important to note that these Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander producers are spread out across the country and not, are not just concentrated in Hawaii. And the top three states are Hawaii, California, and Texas. And the bottom three states are Illinois, South Carolina, and Mississippi. Okay, that wraps my section up. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, Keely. We appreciate that. Uh, Please feel free to write any questions that you have in the questions tab of your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll address those after each presentation. Uh, just a few things came in while we were going through that pertain to the entire presentation. We had a comment earlier that uh, USDA NASA's data um, is not all-encompassing, and I think um, they would agree. So they get information from producers, and there's all types of other information uh, that may be relevant. And so don't consider this a one-stop shop, but just a starting place. Uh, if you're on a reservation, uh, you might uh, talk to BIA about any information they would have. Um, you might reach out to other agencies at USDA to see if they have information you need. And then uh, tribes may keep their own records. Uh, so coordinate with as many entities as you um, would like to try to get a fuller picture. Another comment that came in was related to um, the demographic data that we're talking about. Uh, the comment was related to self-reporting, and so as Ginger uh, talked about earlier, um, they take self-reported data. Um, there's two things to bring up there. One, uh, you have to fill out the census for your information to be counted. So we know that right now is the national census um, that happens every 10 years and how important that is, um, not just for the general population, but especially for American Indian and Alaska Native Native Hawaiian people to participate in that. It's the same thing when we talk about the ag census. Um, so when you get that the next time, I think that would be 2022, please do fill it out. And then in terms of self-reported, uh, just think about the data in that manner. Um, people are selecting one or multiple races or ethnicities as they go along.
So thank you, Keely. Uh, we welcome any questions as we go. Next, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Cindy Farley. Uh, she'll tell you a little about herself and then she'll share her screen and uh, take us through her case study. Hello everyone and good day. My name is Cindy Farley and I'm an enrolled citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in North Central South Dakota. I work at NAF as an associate program officer as well as a youth and beginning farmer rancher liaison. Today I'll be presenting a case study on the Cheyenne River Indian Reservation where I'm from to show you the kind of information available through the egg census that I found personally interesting. Um, like Carly said, this isn't a one-stop shop and there's a lot more information um, than what we're just showing you. So to start off, a little bit about the Cheyenne River Indian Reservation. Here's a map of it. Um, the headquarters is in Eagle Butte, South Dakota. This is the reservation size estimated population. Yeah. So Ginger touched a little on the top 10 reservations for the number of farms and producers and the number of reservation acres. Cheyenne River was on both lists um, which doesn't surprise me because of our large land base and our general ag background and history. Um, so for the farms and acreage, I did a little bit of a comparison. Um, on the side, you can see some bullet points of some stats. And even though the number of farms went down for American Indian and Alaska Native operated um, farms, we're farming more acres and increasing American Indian and individual farm acres, which is building capacity. So in this slide, it's the share of egg production comparison again. In both number of farms and land and farms, native producers have increased their share of the total in the last five years. This increase means that the native producers make up at least half of all farms and land and farms on the Cheyenne River Indian Reservation. The next thing I'm going to talk about um, is the tenure type, but I wanted to give some definitions beforehand. So the full owner uh, operated only land that they own part owner operated land that they own and land that they rented from others, or in this case, leased from the tribe or individual lotties. The tenant operated only land they rented from others or worked on shares for others. These operations are classified as tenant farms when the only land they operate, operate is permit land on the reservations. Um, this is important to study because of the complex history of Indian land and land tenure and how that impacts tribal and native ag today. Uh, we need to learn more about it so we can teach more about it and get the accurate um, facts out there to everybody. So with that, I wanted to show the farms by tenure type comparison from 2012 to 2017. Um, here it shows that full ownership by American Indian and Alaska Native decreased, but part ownership by American Indian and Alaska Native increased, meaning that the American Indian and Alaska Native um, individuals are still invested at least partly. Uh, this is similar to the last slide, the share of farms by tenure and tenure type. Uh, the more, more American Indian and Alaska Native farms are now operating a mix of owned and leased land up by 11 percentage points from 2012 to 2017. And American Indian and Alaska Native farms make up the vast majority of leased only operations on the Cheyenne River Indian Reservation. This is another really cool um, thing with the acres by tenure type. So again, you can see both full ownership and part ownership by American Indian and Alaska Native farms have increased acreage. Full ownership significantly at 95%. So what that means is that there's more land in Indian hands or Indian ownership and um, more Indian operated lands, which is always good. Again, the shares of acres, uh, American Indian and Alaska Native producers have a significant share of the tenant land even though that share went down in the last five years. American Indian and Alaska Native producers have greatly increased their share of the overall on owned land operation. Uh, the market value of agricultural products sold uh, from 2012 to 2017, the MVPS, uh, um, it increased for American Indian and Alaska Native farms and decreased overall. The pleasant surprise, it's a pleasant surprise since usually it's kind of the opposite. Um, this is just a visual of what the previous slide shows for 2017. Even though the MVPS increased for American Indian and Alaska Native farms and total decreased, they still only claim a small share of total. So um, 
that's why it looks really there's a big gap in between all of those. Uh, same with the average farm totals and the other categories such as livestock, poultry, and then the crops. Livestock also dominates the area um, on Cheyenne River, specifically cow, calf, and beef cow operations, which is also found in the 2017 census on the Indian reservations. Um, other than that, I kind of just wanted to highlight some other select characteristics and the differences over the years. Um, the other demographics you can find are gender, which has decreased for both the um, all farms as well as the farms operated by American Indian and Alaska Natives. Um, and then the average age, which has gone up, which kind of follows suit with the national average. And I just wanted to close on two of the new categories from 2017 that I found interesting and um, and really cool. The young producers. Uh, this is very important to highlight because, you know, with the average age, like I mentioned before, of farmers going up, it's good to see that there are younger producers stepping up to fill their shoes and fill in the gaps there. The second one is military service. So um, American Indians and Alaska Natives serve in the armed forces at a higher rate than any other race. So it's important to acknowledge that uh, as well as half the veteran farmers on Cheyenne River are also American Indian and Alaska Native. Uh, Anyway, Wopila, thank you for letting me share and contribute to this. I hope you got something from it. Thank you, Cindy. I think the really great part of Cindy's presentation is that she showed you the diversity of information available for American Indian uh, reservations. Uh, that information I will show you how to access just in a moment, uh, but the sky's the limit in terms of combinations of what you could study. So I wanted to share uh, just for a moment about how I approach the census data, um, because if you go in um, without a game plan, you could find yourself getting lost into a rabbit hole. So uh, this is not scientific, but here are my steps to utilizing ag data. One, I suggest that the first thing you do is define your study area. Ask yourself, what uh, geographical area do I want to know about? Uh, if you are in a tribal community, uh, you know what the boundaries of that community are. You can uh, figure that out in multiple ways. Maybe it's counties, maybe it's uh, reservation, uh, zip codes. I think there's also congressional districts. So the information is broken down in lots of ways. Figure out which one is best for you and um, what your study area is. You can always Oh, thank you. There's my screen. So you can always um, s expand your search uh, later on. Number two, I would suggest that you identify your study parameters because there's so much information available. Think of one, two, three uh, key aspects that you want to learn about. Uh, I'll show you mine in a bit and we'll go over lots of options later. Number three is to think about your time span. So uh, Ginger mentioned earlier that the agriculture census has been happening for a long time. Uh, USDA NAS took it over in 1997. So even there, you have lots of options on um, how far back you want to look. So think about your time span before you get started. Next. Number four, gather the data. So once you've done some of that pre-planning, uh, then sit down and go find it. I'm gonna show you just in a little bit when I uh, go to the website, how you might access it. Uh, once you get all the data together, look at it and try to interpret the findings. Um, this is a difficult part uh, because you don't wanna mix up correlation for causation, okay? You just wanna be really careful to say, this is what it seems like is happening. Let me find all the reasons why that might be and um, talk to other people to try to corroborate that. And then finally, number six, all of this uh, should be to the point of how will you better serve your audience? Um, I have a picture here of a native produce farmer from my area of the world in North Carolina. And so looking at this, how will I better serve her? All right, so let's do the case study and step by step. Number one, uh, Robinson County, 
This is where I'm from, Robinson County, North Carolina. You can see it's in the southeastern part of the state, outlined in red there. I picked this uh, because it's the home of the Lumbee tribe, my tribe, and it's also my home of my family. Uh, there's a picture of my father and my uncle working on the beef farm that we have. So think about your study area of interest. Number two, figure out some parameters. What do you want to zero in on? I've chosen two parameters. Uh, that's American Indian, Alaska Native producers. Uh, that's because that's the category that I would fall into. And um, quite a bit of the farmers in my area would identify as Lumbee or other tribes. And then tobacco industry. I grew up on a tobacco farm. I remember being in the fields just a little bit. Uh, and to the left is a picture of a tobacco farm reminiscent of the Depression era. And this hangs over my family's couch at home. So think about your parameters and list those out. Next, think about your time period. I'm going to choose the last 10 years. That's 2007 to 2017. That means there were three census um, of agriculture in that period. Uh, two factors in deciding what to choose. One is, uh, what do you want to know? Ideally, I would have been looking at information from prior to 2004. In 2004, the tobacco buyout. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. So um, I would ideally be looking at prior to 2004, but when I went to find the data, I only found it starting in 2007. You may run into that as well. Uh, NAS changes their questions over time and they get better as they go. So some of the information you're looking for might not be available when you need it. So uh, the next thing is number four, gather the data. So I take my parameters of interest, American Indian tobacco farmers in Robinson County, North Carolina. I take my time of interest, 2007, 2012, and 2017, and I go look for data. I'm going to pull out two things here from the information online. One is farms, so how many farms uh, have those parameters, and the other is market value of products sold in thousands of dollars. We see here that in 2007, 13 American Indian tobacco farms were registered in Robinson County. That goes down to eight and then to three in a period of 10 years. And that's a decrease of 77%. Market value of products sold in thousands of dollars nominal uh, started at $2,989. Uh, uh, nominal means the price and the amount that it was in that year. I want to be able to compare over years and we know that inflation happens. And so in the next row, I've adjusted that to real terms. Uh, that just means that everything you see there is shown in 2017 dollars. So in real terms, the market value of products sold has decreased 18% in those 10 years. And then finally, in that last row, I took the market value of products sold on a real basis and divided it per farm. That's an idea of the uh, amount of revenue from this industry, tobacco, that came into each of those farms in that year. In 2007, that was $272,000. In 2017, it went up to $962,000. That's quite an increase. It's 254% increase. So that's gathering the data and uh, showing it in a manner that helps you uh, look at it. Number five, you want to uh, paint a full picture and interpret your findings. So the first thing you want to do is pull in additional information to give context. Okay, so I learned about the American Indian tobacco farms in Robinson County. I want to compare that to something. So I built the same table for white tobacco farmers in Robinson County. You can see their information below. They also had a great decrease in number of farms over the time period, an even bigger decrease in market value products sold on a real basis, um, and a consolidation as well. Um, in 2007, a white tobacco farm in Robinson County would have brought in $361,000 in market value of products sold, and that went up to 638 10 years later. But um, it wasn't quite as consolidated as American Indian. Uh, and you can see in 2017, an American Indian tobacco farm in Robinson County had an average of 962,000 in market value products sold, whereas a white farmer had 638. Um, I think 
This is the area where you want to be careful uh, about drawing conclusions and you can't really say for sure why that happens unless you do a lot more rigorous economic research, but perhaps that's because there are still 14 uh, white tobacco farms as opposed to three American Indian tobacco farms and um, that means the American Indian was consolidated more. You should also talk to experts, do a Google search for articles, and think about major market or world events. Uh, one of your best resources is producers. So if I was going to do this for a real report, the first thing I would do is call my father, who's a former tobacco farmer in Robinson County, uh, tell him what I found and get his thoughts on it. Uh, because people who are in the industry themselves and on the ground will have a perspective that will be very helpful. And then number six, uh, just think about the impact to the people you serve. At the end of the day, the biggest part of your data utilization will be how it impacts your service. Uh, this is a picture of a tobacco farm of late summer uh, 2019 from my area. If I was working in Robinson County and seeking to serve native tobacco farmers, uh, some things I would take away from this is that they are pretty big operations. Um, they're dealing close to a million dollars just in tobacco and market value of products sold. And so they might need a special type of service that someone who is doing a smaller scale operation wouldn't need. And that would just help me figure out how to best serve. So I just want to pause here for a moment and see if there's any questions. We do have one question that um, pertains overall to the presentation today, and it says, is there a directory of Native American farmers and producers? That's a good question. And Janie, would you mind jumping in to address that? Yeah, I'd actually love to jump in and address that. I'm not sure where the question came from, but I'm glad whoever asked it uh, came forward. Um, this is an issue that, um, that I would love if we actually spent all some time talking amongst ourselves about whether that's a good thing for us to do, and if so, how would we get it done? Um, let me give you an example of why registry would be really good. Uh, and Carly could probably jump in here as well. Uh, USDA is gonna announce tomorrow uh, COVID direct payments to agriculture producers. And as a result, individual agricultural producers will have the opportunity to go in to, I believe, I think Graham was on that phone call, another member of our staff, and found out that they must go into the, to the local farm service agency office um, and really basically turn in their application for that funding. Here's the problem. Um, we here at NAF would love to be able to send a, a notice to everybody's inbox, <laughs> um, you know, at their farm and ranch if they have internet access so that we could actually alert them specifically that this is applicable to them and that they should consider actually uh, applying for those direct payments as a COVID you know, relief uh, payment. But right now, to our knowledge, there's not really a functional registry of native uh, farmers and ranchers uh, available. And um, we are considering um, how we would go about standing that up. We'd wanna make sure that it was secure uh, meaning that not anybody could just come and have access unless you, as the producer, granted access to you being on that list. There's a lot of things to think about in that way, but we're seeing, and, and I've seen over the life of my career, many, many times when it would re really serve us well to have a registry that's maintained by Native organizations and that allows us to actually communicate as as uh, seamlessly as possible. So I'm, I'm happy for the question. And if y'all have got anybody on the call or on the webinar or anyone in your communities thinks that's a good idea, please let us know because uh, we are seriously tossing that around because we, we do know that it comes in handy at times like this when you need to get the word out. Thank you, Janie. And so now we're nearing the end of what we had prepared for you today. Uh, the last thing I'm going to do is share my screen and start at a blank Google window. You've heard lots of presentations about the data. Uh, you might be asking, where do I find it? So I just want to walk with you briefly through how you might find some information. 
I'm just going to type in USDA NAS census. You can tell that I've done this a few times. Uh, any variation of that should bring you to the right place. I'm going to go to the nasusda.gov website. There's lots of ways to get there, but if you see this orange bar, I think orange was the theme for 2017, then you found the right spot. Now, on this page, the NAS homepage, there's lots of good information too, so uh, please do go through that at your will, but we want to go specifically to the Census of Agriculture. Here we are in 2017 publications. Uh, first, I'll point out one thing here. You can choose a different year, uh, and this goes all the way back to 1840. Uh, I haven't gone to the 1840 to see what's there, but uh, maybe you should if you're interested in that. Um, but we're going to stick with 2017 for the purposes of this demonstration. Everything you need is on this one page, so you might even want to star it so that you can get back to it. The first thing you're going to see is U.S. summary and state data. They always uh, provide things in multiple ways. So there's a U.S. by table or states by table. Uh, let's just open it up, see what this looks like. All right, when we get to the state level data, there are so many tables. I'm just going to scroll to the bottom to tell you how many. 57 tables uh, are available here. Cindy mentioned that new and beginning producers was an important part of what we do and hopefully what you'll be thinking about. So let me open that one and just show you what it would be. So these tables are black and white and little numbers. Uh, first of all, you can zoom in as necessary. Okay, so please don't hesitate to do that. Um, and then just figure out which uh, column you want to see and which row. There are other ways to look at the data too, and I'll show you later, but these tables are a pretty uh, basic element of it. So let's say all farms with a new and beginning producer. This tells you the number of farms. This tells you new and beginning producers. And this tells you the land in farms that have new and beginning producers. So you can just find your state. New Mexico is a state of interest for us. So there's 7,295 farms in New Mexico that have a new and beginning producer. Okay. So you can find information like that. Let's go back. Um, also on the state level information, we see female producers, we see maple syrup, uh, we see field seeds, grass seeds, forage, hay, and silage. These are just different examples, hogs and pigs, hired farm labor, and summary highlights. So just uh, play around here on this page and give yourself a sense of uh, your state. Next, I'll go back to this main page, and you can find information in these appendices about how um, this was structured, the methodology and general explanations, state and county data. So a lot of us are serving tribal communities, uh, and we want to drill down uh, to a more specific area. Um, I am going to pick on my home because uh, I know about it. So there's North Carolina. Again, quite a number of tables here. I'm just going to go to cattle and calves. Instead of doing the PDF of the table this time, I'm going to use this thing called query tool. Okay, so just open that and we'll walk through it together. Okay, so uh, basically this is a way to help search for what you're looking for and narrow it down. It already inputted this. I'm looking at state and county level data. I'm looking at cattle and calves. I'm in North Carolina. I'm looking for that. Now I get to choose a county. Okay. And I'm going to scroll till I find Robinson. Always give it a moment to update, update the grid. Okay. So now I'm looking at only Robinson County. And I can find things uh, like the beef cattle operations inventory. So how many operations have one to nine cattle? 52 operations do. How many beef cattle operations are there total? 164. So there's lots of information you can find uh, in my area. Uh, 
poultry and hogs would be uh, bigger. So I might want to zoom in on that. Um, tobacco, like I did before, uh, it just keeps going. You can find out about operations with sales and um, all those things, sales measured in head. Lots of ways that the data is broken down for you. So I'm going to go back to the main page now. We've looked at states by table and county level data. Information will be made available for um, Puerto Rico, Guam, and other places later this summer. You can always look here in the release date. If something is not available yet, it'll tell you the target date for a release. So the census data query tools, kind of what we used before, I'm going to open it in its own special window. And this just starts from the beginning. There's going to be options in these drop downs and you pick what is important to you let's say irrigation i know irrigation is really important for folks in the southwest and other areas so let's do irrigation in arizona um, and don't need to do the county i'm going to update the grid how many irrigated operations in arizona and this information is broken down into category. So for farms operations that are 2,000 or more acres, you can see that there are 118 operations that are 2,000 or more acres with irrigation. You can also see how many acres are irrigated in, in certain categories. Um, and Irrigation status on any operation, 1.1 million. So lots of information that's specific to what you want to know. Let's go back to the main page here. I'm not going to click on every one of these, but some are um, helpful to see things in an interactive map. So please take a look at that. If you wish, zip code tabulations were released. Uh, you can go here and you can put in your zip code and find lots of information organized in that manner. Here's where you find the American Indian Reservations data. It's under subject series. It's available three different ways. The PDF is um, a table like we saw before. It might take a little while for it to load on my internet. You see my blue bar up here, but it will show selected American Indian Reservation data. It's not for everyone and um, we can have Ginger or folks come back on to tell how those are selected. It is loading. I will come back to it, I promise. I just want to show you that there's watershed information using the six digit hydrologic unit code, uh, specialty crop information. Then there's some special studies. So the 2018 Census of Aquaculture was released last December. There's an irrigation and water management survey. So the census is the overall encompassing agriculture um, report, but then they do these special series and special studies. Uh, so if aquaculture is your thing, go here and you'll find specific. Uh, one that I really want to point out is this 2020 local food marketing practices survey. A lot of our people, native producers, are getting into direct marketing. And so when this comes out in fall 2021, I know it's a while away, that'll be interesting to see. Let's see if this is loaded. It has. Uh, my favorite tool for looking at this is a 222 pages. So I would suggest that you search for what you want to see. Earlier I searched for Navajo and you can just click through and see everywhere it's listed. Um, briefly, here is the type of information you might find uh, for selective reservations. Farms, how many acres on the farm, what's the average size of a farm, and how many reservation acres on the farm. Uh, information about cropland harvested, percent of livestock on the reservation, farms by size, there's lots more information available. Cindy showed you some tenure type information. Here's value of sales and market value of products sold, farm production expenses. So it really is pretty extensive in what you may find. There's some land use practice, um, some farm characteristics, including internet access and legal status of the farm. 
So I won't go much more into much more detail there, but just know it's available. Going back to this original page uh, where we first landed the 2017 Census of Agriculture, uh, we go down to the rankings and profiles. Much of the information that you saw presented from NAF comes from this one area, race, ethnicity, and gender profiles. So let me open that up. And this is the area that Ginger works in. And so if you have questions, please uh, do send them in and we'll have the experts answer. So you can look at a profile for the entire US and I think that's what I'll do. We open it up, it's a nicely formatted PDF that shows some um, high level information. The first uh, segment of the population that you'll see is American Indian Alaska Native producers in 2017. So looking at this, I can tell you that there were 60,083 farms with American Indian Alaska Native producers. There were 2 million farms overall. The average size of an American Indian Alaska Native farm is 978 acres, whereas the average overall is 441. Um, that's twice, so it's interesting there. Then I wanna point out this net cash farm income per farm. Uh, so we go down here, per farm average, net cash farm income, for farms with American Indian Alaska Native producers across the country, it averages $8,577 in net cash farm income, whereas um, all farms altogether have $43,000 in net cash farm income. Uh, something interesting to think about, farms with American Indian Alaska Native producers are twice as big, uh, but have a lot less net cash farm income. So I won't draw any conclusions here, but just look into that and look into it for your specific area. Uh, you could drill in on Oklahoma and see how the state compares to the average overall in the country. Uh, you could drill into a specific county. I don't even know which one I picked. I'm sorry, my Oklahoma geography is not that strong, but I picked Delaware. So we can see that there are 517 farms with American Indian Alaska Native producers in Delaware County, Oklahoma. You can try this on your own. Uh, going back to the main page here, just a few more things to point out. Uh, there's some ranking information that say what is the uh, most um, heavily concentrated crop in your area. You can find out there, there's some 2017 congressional district profiles and district rankings. Uh, we'll just take a look. This is especially important if you want to uh, talk to your elected representatives uh, because they are interested in what happens in their boundaries. And here you go, you're able to tell them. Total uh, farm producers and number of farms by congressional district. Open it up and um, scroll through and see what you can learn, all right? Okay, so that was just a, a quick overview of how to navigate the website. Uh, they are uh, really pros at this, of course. Uh, if you have any questions uh, about where to find specific information, let us know. We'd be happy to spend some time with you to look for something. And if it's not reported, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ginger, you, the NAS is always looking to improve their reporting. And so if there's some information you want, it's not gonna hurt for you to reach out to Ginger and just say, hey, I'd really like to know this. It's not a guarantee that the census would include it next time, but that's how it gets improved over time. That's true. Um, I think, um, we have a place on our census page where you can submit feedback. You can also email me. In addition, if we collected the data on the census and we didn't publish it because we didn't know people wanted it tabulated that way, uh, you can submit a request for a special tabulation on the census page under the data and statistics button, Carly. There's a, if you click that down arrow under data and statistics, in the lower right hand side you can see special tabulations about special tabulations um, how you would go about requesting a special tabulation for the most part 
they're done free of charge um, unless they're very long and complex. However, this is not something that has a quick turnaround time. Think more like months instead of days. So it's always easiest and better. I mean, it's almost always more practical to use an existing data set um, to find the data you want. And there is a lot of data available, and it's not always clear at first glance where it may be. So, you know, if you have any questions, just make sure to reach out and say, I'm looking for this. And we can definitely tell you if it exists or it doesn't exist and how to find it. Thank you. So now I'd like to entertain questions that you may have um, the, to Janie's answer before to the question about a directory. Uh, we've had quite a few comments come in to say that that would be wonderful, that they would use it in their service. Um, one says, I think it would be wonderful for NAF to build a register. I wanted to do a survey of farmers producers regarding our training that extension could provide. Um, I tried to reach out to the local farm bureau for restrictions, so it'd be really great to have a way to access this population. And another person writes, it is a challenge to reach individual producers who live across the country, especially American Indian Alaska Native producers who live in states that do not have federally recognized tribes, may be underserved or unaware of their programs in the 2018 Farm Bill. I think that's a great point to highlight. Uh, a lot of times when we talk about Native agriculture, we are um, implicitly assuming that Native producers are working on their tribal lands or near their tribal lands, but we have people who are scattered throughout the country and um, they need to be included in our work as well. Yeah, Carly, I want to say another thing about that. I'm, I'm really glad to have the feedback from today uh, from y'all about that issue. I, I, my gut has been telling me for a while that this would be a really important thing for us to do. Um, we can do all sorts of protections around it, you know, and we can assure people that, you know, we're not going to sell their name and all of those things that people get concerned about when they sign up for, for having their name somewhere. And the fact that we're a native led and native focused organization, I think should offer a lot of people some assurance about how uh, tightly we're going to hold the data. We just, I just feel like there's, we got to be able to communicate with each other better and I think it will really make it uh, a lot easier I think uh, for folks who are eligible organizations to receive funding from NAF to actually have that kind of backup. Um, the other thing I'll share with you is um, you know I'm Chickasaw and my tribe actually has a small business registry and it's entirely voluntary and if you have a you know Chickasaw owned a uh, small business, then you can just sign up and you're just, and you receive notifications of, of things as they occur that might be of interest to small businesses and, and just general information. I just think it would really help us be uh, a lot more fluid uh, with everybody that we serve and all of the organizations that we work with. Um, if we could really kind of put a support system under our native farmers and ranchers and food people in a deeper way. And so uh, we may, Carly, I think, add this question to our survey that's on our website and just keep gathering some information. But I think uh, we should start to really figure out how this would work. So thank you all very much for providing that input. Thank you, Janie. I would just like to give one more moment for others to send in their question or comment before we close out. Ginger, I just wanted to come back around about that uh, Navajo chapter house information. What would be the best way for the interested folks to um, access that? Well, there should be, um, it's actually coming, I was wrong. I thought it was coming out today, but it was actually, it's actually coming out on Monday, probably at noon. And um, if you go to our, that 2017 census webpage, that orange banner, you showed us earlier there should be a link towards the bottom of the page uh, directing you to that data set so um yeah let's you should just be able to see it on monday okay and um you said here on this page it'll be published yes um and i would guess towards the bottom of the page as it will probably 
I should know this. I think it's going to be in the special studies or custom census products, one of those two. Um, probably in the um, custom census products is where it will end up. Thank you. And uh, to the person who asked that question, if you have any trouble finding it, uh, reach out to us and we'll make sure you get it. So um, not seeing any other questions, I just, I hope that this was helpful for you. Uh, if you are interested in more uh, content like this, please let us know. Um, we'd be happy to provide more. This was just an overview 101. Um, if you have questions about specific uh, studies. Uh, we can help on a case-by-case -case basis to point you in the right direction. Ginger has also offered her contact information. We really would love to see um, all folks in native agriculture uh, use this to um, the best of its ability. Uh, of course, noting that there may be limitations and that you might need to get data from other places. Would anybody else uh, on our panelists like to share any closing words? Just thanks for the opportunity, um, Carly, to have us participate. And you guys did such a wonderful job of sharing our census data. I love the use of it and how in-depth the analysis was. It's great to see people using data. As Jamie said, I am a data nerd at heart. I, someone even gave me a sticker. And um, <laughs> data nerds unite. Thank you, Ginger, and it's been a pleasure to work with you and all the folks at NAS. I just want to point out, as Ginger said at the beginning, uh, you have NAS staff in your state, okay? And so um, you can contact us, but you can also reach out to them and uh, see what they can do for you. And especially just keep in mind that as the next Census of Agriculture uh, 2022 comes along, we need all of our native producers to fill it out to the best of their ability. Okay, not seeing any other questions. I would like to thank you for your time. Uh, this recording will be available on our website. It'll also be emailed to you tomorrow. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.